Well, hello, I'm Mike, and welcome to the 10-Minute Bible Study. Today we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 18, through chapter 3, verse 6. So grab a Bible, and let's dive in. Now, most Bibles break up this section of Scripture into three distinct sections. They're snapshots, and there are two themes that kind of follow them throughout. On the one hand, we see Mark developing the idea of Jesus' authority, particularly his authority over the law. Second, we see the continual evolution of Jesus' relationship with the Pharisees. It begins, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to him, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. First, it's worth noting that fasting was just an everyday normal part of Jewish spiritual life. It seems the Pharisees fasted, John's disciples fasted. This is an expectation for Jews. Now on to weddings. Historically speaking, wedding feasts required seven days of feasting. And one was not permitted to fast or any of the activities connected with mourning or uh, even heavy lifting, working, wasn't allowed during a wedding feast. Now, what Jesus is saying here is that to mourn while he's with them would be inappropriate. You wouldn't do that. Now, Jesus is saying here that he is the bridegroom. This is a theme that was well-developed, especially in the Old Testament prophets. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, they all describe God's relationship with his people as a bridegroom with a bride be it an adulterous bride. And Mark here is beginning to tease out that same metaphor, associating Jesus, who he is, with the God of the Bible. Now, it's worth noting that Jesus is also, in verse 20, beginning to hint at his death. He will one day be gone, and then it will be a good, even appropriate time for followers of him to fast. I know it's popular in some Protestant circles to say that we don't have to fast anymore, but actually what Jesus seems to be saying here is then you will fast. Just as this was a given part of the spiritual life of ancient Jews, so it should be a given part of the spiritual life of followers of Jesus. Mark continues in verses 21 and 22. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and the worst tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Jesus uses two metaphors, two ordinary facts, to prove a point. He talks about cloth, how it shrinks, and wineskins, how it expands. And in both instances, putting new in with the old, or on the old, just doesn't work. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I'm doing a new thing. What is happening here, this kingdom of God, it is new. He's not merely reinterpreting the old, what has gone before, but he's transforming it into something entirely different. And he seems to be saying even that he has the authority to do that, not just to reinterpret the old, but to transform the old. If that first section is about fasting, the second section is about the Sabbath. Mark writes, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. First, if you want to go back and read that David story, I'll include that in the description. You can find it in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Now, it's worth noting here that Jesus' disciples are breaking the letter of the law, or at least they're breaking the contemporary interpretation of the letter of the law. Deuteronomy 23, 25 says that there should be no farm work on the Sabbath. And Exodus 34, 21 says that there should be no reaping on the Sabbath. Now, to consider what the disciples here were doing, farming or reaping is a bit of a stretch, but you can see how people who took the law really seriously might have made that jump. 
Now, the way that Jesus responds to them offers us a helpful lesson in how we think about hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a fancy term to describe the art or the science of biblical interpretation. Now, what Jesus is doing here is he is interpreting scripture. He's interpreting the Old Testament law as it pertains to what one can do on the Sabbath, and he's interpreting it using the Bible itself. In this case, the story of David. We ought to interpret the Bible using the Bible. That's why there's footnotes in our Bibles where we can look up Old Testament references. That's why oftentimes in these Bible studies, I do word studies to see how other writers are, are, are using a word to help us understand the meaning. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's using the Bible, an Old Testament story of David, to reinterpret or to interpret the law for the Pharisees. Jesus also offers a new authoritative interpretation of the law, and not just an interpretation of the law, but of the purpose of the law in verses 27 and 28. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now what Jesus is saying here is that the purpose of the law is not the law itself. The purpose of the law is for our good. That's why God gave us the law, to protect us, to serve us, not the other way around. So what Jesus is doing is not just offering a new interpretation of the law, but he's offering a new interpretation regarding the why of the law. And he's doing it to people who have spent their lives studying it. And as he makes his case, he's simultaneously arguing that he is in fact the Son of Man, the promised Messiah. Now that brings us to chapter 3 and the man with the withered hand. Mark writes, Mark writes, Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Jesus entered the synagogue again. He's developing a pattern here. It's Sabbath. And like any good Jew, Jesus goes to synagogue. Now in verse 2, we see that the Pharisees were watching Jesus. They're beginning to try to trap him. Jesus' response over the two sections before this bothered them more and more. And it's easy to understand why they might. After all, Jesus is challenging everything that they believe to be true. He's challenging their authority and their deeply held religious beliefs and convictions, as well as their very way of life. And this challenge really rubs them the wrong way. As we've seen throughout the first couple chapters of Mark, posture matters. And for the Pharisees here, the posture is not one of humility or openness. Instead, they're beginning to close themselves off. The word Mark is going to use here later in chapter 3 is hardness of heart. That's how he describes their posture towards Jesus. Now, because Jesus cares even about those who are out to get him, praise the Lord. He asks them a question. He gives the Pharisees a chance to engage, to enter into a relationship with him. In their silence, it speaks volumes about the conditions of their hearts. And Jesus looked around at them in anger and grieved at their hardness of heart. These two words here tell us an awful lot about Jesus. Anger, the Greek is orge, is almost always used in the New Testament to describe the wrath of God, God's righteous anger, his indignant, justified, passionate anger about being wronged or about sin. And then Jesus is grieved. This is the only time that this word is used in the New Testament, and it conveys deep sorrow. Taken together, we see that Jesus is not indifferent to their hardness of heart. He feels something in response to it. Righteous indignation and anger and deep grief and sorrow at the same time. Jesus is not cold or dispassionate. Instead, he's full of emotions, just like any other man or woman. Now, at this point, I think Jesus knows that it's not likely to end well for him. And yet he heals the man's hand anyway. The text tells us it was restored back to its original function, the way it was intended. And in response, the Pharisees begin to plot his death with the Herodians, that is, with the political powers of the day. And in response to this healing, the Pharisees begin to plot Jesus' death with the Herodians, that is, the political power of the day. Now, this response to this healing stands in contrast with what we saw back in Mark chapter 2, where Jesus heals a paralytic. In that instance, the Pharisees still questioned in their hearts. Their posture is not great in when it happens, and yet the end result there is praising. Here, the Pharisees question Jesus in their hearts again, only this time they don't respond with praise. They respond by plotting Jesus' death. And in the span of just one chapter, the Pharisees have gone from curious and hardness of heart that still ends up glorifying Jesus to hardness of heart that leads to plotting his death. 
But this is just like Jesus, isn't it? He knows restoring this man's hand is going to lead to this sort of reaction, and yet he does it anyway. He knows bringing restoration to his people is going to lead to his death, and yet, again, he does it anyway. feels deep sorrow for the lost, even for those who plot his death. And so we see here in our text today that Jesus demonstrates authority. He demonstrates authority not just in the physical realm by healing, but over the law. And he does it in a way that's scandalous to the powers of the day and costly for him. It's an authority that's demonstrated under, at great personal cost, not an authority that's demonstrated over by dominating others. And we see this in Jesus even as early as here in chapter 3. Thanks so much for joining me for this episode of the 10-Minute Bible Study. If it was helpful for you, please feel free to share, like, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. <music>